Thank you. Let me start by telling you that I'm a business person, but I do have a lot of thoughts on the subject of civic engagement and getting involved. My parents moved to Hong Kong in 1949 to escape the Civil War. And a, a couple years later, I was born. So, little cute baby. I contracted polio about the time this picture was taken. That affected my legs and my right arm. So when I was a child, I was pretty sick. And at that time, most of the facilities were not accessible. So I didn't really get to get out of the house much. And the only thing I remember ever getting out of the house was to go to this wedding banquet. I was five years old. I want to show this to show you how, how much of a cute kid I was. That was really one of the happiest moments because I got to go outside that house. And of course, I didn't really get to receive a formal education. I stayed home and I learned whatever I could from using my brother's textbook and learning on my own. But around 11 years so, I finally had to find the opportunity to get a formal education. That's when I'm about 11 or 12. So I finally had the opportunity to go to school and get an education. About five and a half years later, I ended up at UCLA majoring in physics. I was pretty good at it, I had to admit, and I was on my way to get a PhD. And, but one summer, I decided to, sub, to take some time off to help my parents start a business because like any immigrant son, it's, I felt responsible to help my family settle down in this country. And uh, so I took one summer off and trying to help them start a business. I never went back to finish my PhD. However, I do know a lot of people, people in the scientific research community. That's why the subject of, we discussed yesterday, Sherry Chan and Professor C, really meant a lot to me because it could have easily been me. So we started a small toy wholesale business in the worst part of downtown Los Angeles because that was all we could afford. And being, you know, I really didn't know much about business. I learned everything on, from day to day of how to really run the business. I remember that I went to a bank in Chinatown to get a business loan. And actually, I got to see the president of the bank. And he asked me whether I have a financial statement. I said, can you tell me what a financial statement is? If you show me an example, I'm pretty sure I can give it to you in, in, in 24 hours. So that's the way I learned how to run business. And most of our customers at that time was small business owners. The vast majority of them were Asian American immigrants. The majority were Chinese Americans. So we started a small business. There were, we had a lot of customers. They were also small Chinese American business people. And when our business grew, we invested in some of the really low cost real estate in the neighborhood. And some of our customers came to us and asked where they could rent space from us so that they can start similar business like ours. The whole idea is to compete with our business. I could have easily said no, but for some reason, I said yes, I think it would be great if all the Chinese immigrants can come together and start a business in the same area. That turned out to be the most important decision that affected the rest of my life. So as the business grew, we have a lot of problems. I got more involved in city hall politics, and we received a lot of attention from urban planners, journalists, because a bunch of Chinese small business immigrants all of a sudden revitalized an area, had a tremendous impact on the business in, Los in the Los Angeles area. So the media started covering me. This is a Los Angeles Times article, New York Times article about how business people like mine change the scene in downtown, and there were scholars, I remember this, this is Harvard economists, that come up the term industry clusters, how industry coming together could really be the most important tool for economic development for the urban area. I was just kind of an example how that theory really worked. I even became a cartoon figure <laughs> in an Inc. magazine article, okay? I was a superhero. And if you notice, I compare Los Angeles to Hong Kong. I had to give my 
place of origin some credit. The idea was Hong Kong became an economic power in Asia was because of its location as a hub of trade between China and the, and the West. And for Los Angeles, pretty much the same thing. With, we, are the, we are the hub of East and West and also Central and South America. So that was my point about taking advantage of the geographic location and the, pop, the diverse population to really grow industries and re revitalize the urban area to get economic strength. And because of my involvement in politics, I got, I got invited to a lot of things. The year 2000, the Democratic National Convention came to Los Angeles. Mayor Reardon appointed me to be in the host committee. I was one of the three or four civic leaders that sort of received all the Democratic uh, leaders and, 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 and activities in Los Angeles. This new, all the reporters and throughout the world came cover, and they found out there was one of the leader was a Chinese American business person. They thought it was odd that that actually a Chinese American, Asian American, small business person got to be in, in a place to represent the city. So they wrote an article about the power brokers really didn't change was because of people like myself. And the next year, I was elected to be the chairman of the LA Chamber of Commerce, probably one of the most prestigious civic organizations, had some 120 years of, of leading, you know, the, the, being the voice of the, the so-called powerful corporate interest in Los Angeles. So LA Times basically had, had an essay about the world was changing because an entrepreneur, a minority, became now the symbol of the economic strength in Los Angeles. I, I was flattered, but I was glad to be recognized, so I, I went along with, with it. Ever since I come to this country, there was always debates. One debate was, are immigrants hurting or helping America? So Fortune magazine decided to do an article on that subject, and their conclusion was, immigrants do benefit America. And I was the number one example, what my family did was an example of how immigrants could benefit America. Again, the debate continued, but so I wouldn't mind being used as an example of that debate. The second debate that we all hear, even until now, is should we engage the world? Does trade hurt or help the United States? This is an economist from Great Britain. So he came and watched me do my business for several days. And he wrote, actually, he wrote a book. And then he submitted one chapter of that book on, again, another Fortune magazine article about whether all the myths of global trade and how he used me as an example about all the myths about global trade being not beneficial to the average small guy was wrong. And he mentioned about Charlie Wu that expect to be a victim of global trade happened to be successful and share the five myths of glo global trade and commerce. Here idea was, the conventional idea was, you need to be an international conglomerate to take advantage of the international business. The small guys got crushed. And I was the smallest of the small guy. And it, instead, we grew into, with all the immigrant business people, we not only survived, we thrive. That was one of the examples he used why global trade is actually beneficial. Then, of course, the debate continued today. As our business grew, the economic trend changed. Doing business with a small, small business community no longer worked. The Walmarts, the giant retailers, start to take over. And we have to adjust our business strategy to meet that challenge. When China went into this manufacturing market to supply products, the, pro the merchandise become commodities. The price got cheaper and cheaper. So in order to survive, we have to add value. So this is a production line that we set up in Los Angeles. We design, create products using local talent. Many of them are immigrant students, 
business people, and we find the advantage of local manufacturing, hiring local people to be an advantage to compete in the global marketplace. And as I mentioned, the market change, this was one of our factory uh, site in Los Angeles. And because we scale our business, we need much larger space. Now we are located in City Commerce. I have about 400,000 square feet of manufacturing space. And then downtown property that I did that was no longer a suitable to, to, for my business. So what I did was I needed to learn how to be a developer on that site, on that what the picture was, now is a 320 units mixed use housing project. We believe when it's done in a couple of months, will really transform the landscape of that industrial part of Los Angeles. Now they call the art districts. It's a really hip fashion place, and I hope that our, you know, our contribution would add to that. By the way, I never learned how to do real estate, and this was my first project. So quickly go over, so summarize what my business experience was that. A lot of people you know, call me visionary, pioneer. I never thought I was. But what I thought I was, that I happened to be in a position to be the beneficiary of many of the global change. I study, I observe, and I process all the information. When I have considered all the trends and come to clarity in my mind what the path should have been to proceed, I proceed with conviction. I don't really care what my thinking would fit into the conventional wisdom. If it does, that was great. If it doesn't, then people would say, I do things outside the box. The fact of the matter was, I never had a training in, in, in business, so I had no idea what the box was. But I only know how to independently <laughs> process that information. I jumped myself. This is a picture that I never shown anybody. And this is probably the worst experience in my entire life. I'm jumping a little bit because I accidentally uh, uh, punch that, that picture. Another reason, the reason I wake up every day, really enjoy my business, is because I know that I have to be at least half a step ahead of everybody else in the ever-changing global environment. The fact that I had to constantly think and strategize with friends I trust or in myself the fun and the challenge was that how to keep up and maintain and grow my business in a very difficult environment. So that was really the reason I'm motivated to be to do what I do. The second reason was being entrepreneur allowed me to be really show interest in other areas that if I had worked for some other organization, I wouldn't have the freedom to do that. One of the things that I really enjoy doing was to encourage civic engagement and political participation. I chair an organization called CAUSE, Center for Asian Americans United for Self. Empowerment is an organization run by young people. Many of them don't even know where my passion came from, why I did what I did. And, and, and I think this is time to really tell my story. About 20 years ago, I was involved in a political scandal. Many consider that to be the biggest political scandal since Watergate. And many consider for Asian Americans, that was the biggest setback since the Chinese Exclusion Act and the internment of Japanese. And I was a central figure in that scandal. I'm going to share with you what I learned from that experience. Because of my involvement in City Hall, so I knew a lot of Asian Americans that also interested in politics. There was this person called John Huang, who was a banker. He resigned, from, he quit his banking president's job to join the Clinton administration in 92. And as he learned more about how policy decisions 
were made in DC, he decided Asian Americans need to do more to gain access. And his strategy was he needed to go out and raise several million dollars for the for the re-election of Bill Clinton so the Asian Americans got a bigger voice. I was skeptical about using money to buy influence, but I didn't have a better idea, so I went along with it. So I was invited to many fundraisers, and that one was one of the fundraisers in a Buddhist temple in Hacienda Heights. And throughout the summer months, the news started covering about some of the major Asian donations to Bill Clinton. They were not legal. And so the reporters were really curious. Why would these Asian Americans funnel so much money to the president? And I was told by many reporters that every time they call up an Asian donor, they refuse to answer the telephone. When they saw the reporter coming, they turn off the light, they close the door, and so a really terrible situation. I never signed up to be a spokesperson for our community, but I felt I have no choice. I had to explain that I saw many people like myself. We participate, we donated. We didn't want anything else other than access, more attention from the government. I also explained that many of the Asian donors that never involved in politics, they donate big money because they want that picture taken and they didn't want anything more. That was really hard to believe and that's still happening today. Of course, we all know that, but for people outside, it was a difficult concept. I have to be honest, I did see a small number of donors that I really didn't feel comfortable with, and those were the ones that turned out to be in trouble. So because I was the only one speaking up, I got a call from every investigating reporter from throughout the country. Some of them were pretty hostile, but I was okay with that, because I think the story needs to be told. Then one day, I got a call from an auditor from the Democratic National Committee. She asked me a whole bunch of questions, fine, I had no problem. She asked me where I came from, citizenship. I thought that was strange. But okay, I answered that. She asked my income, again, I thought that was strange. But I answered. Then she asked me my, for my social security number. I knew she crossed the line. I was angry. So Barbara Streisand to Bill Clinton is like George Clooney to Hillary today. They went to her house, raised tons of money, I say, do you ask Barbara Streisand for her social security number? Why do you ask me? It's because I'm not my last name. I say, before I got mad, I say, what are you going to do if I don't tell you? He say, we are going to release your name to the media as a suspected donor, and you have to deal with it. That was a threat. I didn't like that. I say, I give you my social security number, and Barbara Streisand gives you hers. I hammer the phone. I call the National Democratic National Committee. Nobody answered my phone. I left a message and called me back. They never did. So I figured, I wrote a letter to the chairman and demand an apology. I figured that the press was coming. But I wasn't afraid. So I instead, I blasted both sides. I knew what was coming. The Repu Re Republicans were using bad Asian donation to steer the to broad stroke to taint the whole community so that they can hurt the Democrat. And the Democrat decided before they could do that, they throw us under the bus first to show that they could be just as tough to us so we got hit from all sides. So I decided, you know, enough was enough. I had, if they were coming, I had to hit, attack them first. You know, there were hundreds of donors got that call. I only remember one or two other people spoke up. There was a Korean doctor in Texas. But that was okay. I think that story got to be told. And when the press couldn't intimidate me, the political party didn't intimidate me, the FBI came. They asked me the same type of questions, fine, I had no problem. And then at the end, they handed me a paper and say, this is a subpoena for you to appear in the Washington DC grand jury. And then they add one more thing. They say, I know Mr. Wu, you have been very outspoken. You're really telling a lot about our investigation. The grand jury is a secret process. You have First Amendment right to talk, but you need to know that if what you have to say interfere with our investigation, we're going to charge you with obstruction of justice. 
That was no joke, okay? I'm still a little bit upset about that, but... <laughs> By the way, it was a really surreal experience. If any of you get subpoenaed in front of a grand jury, let's talk, I, let me share my experience with you, okay? You just get surrounded by reporters as you exit the, the courthouse. And I remember my lawyer told me, don't engage, don't look at them, don't talk. And at the end, my lawyer told me, you are fine. Your only problem is because you talk too much. <laughs> so I know your purpose, you want to protect your community, but it's my job to protect you and you need to stop talking. I pay a lot of money for that advice, so I had to listen. <laughs> so I come back, I, you know, I got a whole pile of message from all the reporters, I didn't answer them. And then there was another committee, 100 member, the late California Treasurer Matt Fong. He was running for US Senate, and I, it as, was a good friend. It, he was the one that actually later nominated me to his committee 100. And he had a fundraiser in downtown Biltmore Hotel, I remember that. So I figured that, Things that start quieting down now, I should really go and show him my support. He was a really well-known Republican. I was a Democrat, but that's okay. <laughs> Later did I know, I walk into the hotel, there was media frenzy. All the reporters now bugging him about donations that he received from Chinese and Asian donors. And I walk in there, not with the understanding that I wouldn't talk. I figured they wouldn't know me. I didn't know that. The federal government leaked all the people that they subpoenaed for grand jury. I didn't know that. So I remember a Chinese reporter, a television reporter, just put a camera on my face and say, Mr. We just come back from the grand jury. Did you plead the Fifth Amendment? All the press turned around. I had instruction not to talk. I went into the bathroom, and I didn't know what to say. I took a deep breath, and I, the only way I know is walk back out and start talking. I remember that George Skelton, one of the columns of Los Angeles time, he was probably the most influential of the group. So I, did, I went up to him and said, I need to say something here. We have had enough of this. And I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna participate. This is our right, this is our responsibility. We are not gonna retreat from this. You know, I don't care what the situation is, you know, we are not gonna retreat. So the next day here, the article about Chinese, Asian Americans speak up, so the ties start to change. The more FBI come to talk, there's a congressional hearing, and my, my records are subpoena and all that stuff. But at that time, if they didn't get anything from me by then, they're not gonna get anything from me. So I, I feel good about that. You know, and then the things finally calmed down. But the damage was done. Chancellor Ting from UC Berkeley, another fellow commi a committee 100 member, was supposed to be the Secretary of Energy. Instead, he didn't get it. When the Bill Richardson, then who looked, oversaw the prosecution, went holy. The Cox Committee was set up to investigate people like me. But they didn't, they didn't find anything to decide to investigate a scientist. And you know what happened yesterday. So there the, the, the are two lessons I learned. One is there was a USA reporter ambushed me one day in my office and say, Mr. Wu, you talk about political participation. You didn't even vote. I said, how do you know I didn't vote? You're not registered. I said, you showed my office thinking that I registered in the office. I registered at home. Why don't you go back and research, find out where I live, and then see whether I register or not. So the perception is we don't vote. They, even, they didn't even believe that I actually was a voter. They figured that the reason I, you know, that was just a phony excuse, political participation just excuse, because it wasn't in our nature or community to vote. My theory was that, yes, you can tell people to vote, but you have to let them know what to vote for and the reward of voting. The second lesson I learned was I, that, take, you know, people say our community didn't have the Reverend Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson. Uh, that take me off a little bit. Why didn't we get off our butt and do something ourselves instead of waiting for some leaders to, to lead us? But then I realized that I'm not sure that if we had the talent of Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, they would have been as much influential because they're tied to Reverend. They have the African American churches. They are the organization, the network that support them. And we don't, you know, we are professional lawyers join Asian Chinese Lawyers Association, Dr. Jones Association. We are comfortable in our small circle. We never expand beyond our comfort zone. So in order to have influence, you need to build the network, you need to build coalitions, you need to break that down. It's okay to be in your little family association, but you need to join a bigger cause. And I just, I'm sorry, I did tell one more story about being on the, at the table 
and give back to the community. I have spent 20 some years trying to figure that one out myself. Okay, by the way, one of the things I do is that in order to get encourage people to vote, you have to explain why voting is relevant to them, what to vote for. I have a habit of every year go to the senior center in Chinatown. I could actually keep 100 a couple hundred seniors engaged for a couple hours instead of going to an afternoon nap to talk about <laughs> how every proposition on the ballot could affect them. I'm trying to engage them in debating in, in themselves. It is only through this kind of discussion that m voting means anything. Because if you just tell them to vote and they don't know who to vote for, that really is not sustainable in the long run. By the way, having another reason having strong leaders is that community vote for leaders of their own. But the thing is, you have to make sure the leaders are accountable to be at the table to bring benefit back. Another brief story I want to tell is that 26 years ago, Mayor Tom Bradley, because of my involvement in politics, I, I become very close friend of every mayor in Morton, Los Angeles. Tom Brad I traveled with Tom Bradley uh, uh, to China, and he appointed me to be head of a, to be actually a member of a commission to oversee federal workforce development and job training. Although in my whole life, I've never been accused of outsourcing jobs to China, although I do business in China, instead they give me credit. I know people like myself are vulnerable to accusation that we outsource jobs to China. I need to learn how, to, how workforce development actually could help. I want to contribute to that front so that people would not accuse people like myself to outsource jobs. Instead, we contribute to strategies idea of workforce development. So I got promoted to be the chair, and I've been chairing the committee for the last 20 years, and I was told that nobody has served in any appointed role for the duration I did. Again, I told you the motivation for me to join, the motivation for me to retain is that how to work through an incredible bureaucratic system to benefit the community and make federal money to be better used. One of my highlights, okay, was I was in, invited into a, the mayor invited me into a small group, focus group with the vice president. I didn't know what subject, and then they was talking about minimum wage. This is a year and a half ago. Poor president, you know, the Clinton administration, I mean, Obama administration couldn't even raise the minimum wage before beyond 7.25 an hour. And Los Angeles wanted to raise 15 hours. So the vice president said, how many hall? And then every business people start complaining, although this is handpicked by the mayor, because the Chamber of Commerce opposed that proposal. And although I'm no longer on, on, on the board of Chamber of Commerce, but I have my friends there, I was kind of caught in a difficult situation. And then when the business people start complaining about government mandate to cost, to add that cost to the business, what could the government do to help business? And the mayor turned to me and said, Charlie, you have been working on this. What do you think? And then what we did actually was that our focus has been to really focus on the growth industries, industries that pay high wage jobs and sort jobs that are not outsourced. I start giving example that jobs going to stay in Los Angeles forever, in the healthcare, in the many of the technical jobs, and, and, and because the plumbers, the electricians, or whatever, right? And then the vice president really got excited because, of course, you know, they have a policy and upskilling and, and training people not for low-end jobs because we really felt that, I make the case that, you know, federal government's role is to train the work, workforce, make sure they can upskill their, you know, uplift their skills so that they can take the high-paying job instead of fighting over what the floor is and instead of raising, you know, the skill instead of raising the, 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 the salary. So he was really excited. He finished giving his theory on that. And I said, Mr. Vice President, I have not finished. This is a good policy on paper, but if you want to be successful, you need to make sure that the employers are on board and can really show you the kind of skill is needed instead of you training people in a vacuum. So he was, and then he said something about he was going to retire. He was a lawyer by training, and he really wanted to do transaction law. After he retired, the vice president, uh, being vice president, he might even join me in doing some of the, get more private sector involved, right? I know he wasn't going to work with me, but it was fine. And then everybody, when he finished, everybody wanted to take a picture of him. I had my picture with most president and vice president. I didn't need that picture. 
He grabbed the mayor's hand and ran across the room because I was trying, he was going one way, I'm going to go the other. He said, I'm going to take a big picture of this guy because he's the smartest guy in the room, okay? Again, <laughs> the story could end here, but should end here, but it didn't. Sorry. One, you know, because a week later, Stewart organized a uh, forum with the mayor on what has the mayor done for the Asian community. One of the questions was, what kind of workforce development program that benefit the Asian community? The mayor turned to us and said, Charlie, who's my man? He knows everything. And I explained how it works. We're the best system in the country. You know, we have a performance matrix, and we've done it better than anybody else. And I, want, I make sure that Asian organizations get the money. But I did not answer the question. Was that helpful to Asian Americans? Or, you know, that's not involved in the system. So, you know, being a chair, I had a lot of power. I ordered a study. No. To my horror, Asians did not receive service on a system that I helped design and helped lead. You know, there were 15% Asian populations in County Los Angeles, 12% pop in, in, in the city of Los Angeles, only about 5% received service. I was embarrassed. The guy that talked about returning, get back to the community, and then I realized by holding the service provider accountable, by setting up matrix and performance, I encourage them to go after low hanging fruit. Asian immigrants are harder to serve. So I had a dilemma. How am I going to change the system so that I can live what I preach, you know, get back to the community? So I knew that I couldn't change the system just for Asians. So I, I have a public hearing to find out all the other communities that are underserved. All of a sudden, the transgender community coming up, the foster youth, you know, people that are returned from prison, all of them who are underserved. And I thought we're the best program in the country. Actually, we didn't really reach everybody. That gave me the ammunition. When the first chance I find some money, I didn't say this is my idea. I went to the mayor. I said, the mayor, this is about time for you to take the leadership. Let's roll out a new, new initiative and add a few things about engage the high tech community and let's do this as sort of the workforce redesign 2.0. So early this year, at a press conference, it's the mayor. So money is coming to the underserved community in an RP to come in maybe this week or next. You know, again, hopefully, this would change the way people think about serving the Asian community. I don't know if this would work, because you never know when you're working with Biroc bureaucracy, you never got what you wanted. But I know I've started a conversation that we cannot avoid. I just give you a summary of my business career. The, my motivation of a, encouraging Asian to vote, and the more important, when we elected our leaders to have a seat at the table, what do we expect from them? I have my share of disappointment supporting Asian American candidate that become an embarrassment to our community. I could name names, okay? I think it's, we, you know, we are just not telling people to vote, but to hold the elected official accountable. And I have try and practice about what it takes to give back to the community through the government process. I'm still exploring, but I'm having a lot of fun, so sorry for the overtime.